God has told us in his word that our name was written in the Lamb's book of life before the foundation of the world. Isn't that interesting? God knows, doesn't he? It's wonderful to know that. And I want to tell you something. God does not have an eraser. Did you hear me? God doesn't have an eraser. He doesn't put your name in, take it out, put it in, take it out, put it in. God doesn't mess with that. God has written your name in the Lamb's Book of Life since the foundation of the world. Wonderful, wonderful news. That's great truth. We've been talking about end times. We considered seven years of tribulation. And as we were talking about those times of tribulation, we brought up the words of Jesus from Scripture, from John chapter 5, verse 43, where it says, I am come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. You know, Jesus came into his own, and his own received him not. But he said, in the end times, there's going to be one that's coming, and he is not of the Father. He says he's going to come in his own name, and you're going to receive him. He, of course, is speaking there of the Antichrist that's yet to come, during that seven years of tribulation which we've been talking about, Jesus prophesied that because of their rejection of him, Israel, and we'll talk a little bit about the judgment of Israel today, he said, behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Desolate, that means nothing. It's gone completely. Jeremiah calls this the time of Jacob's trouble. In Jeremiah 37, Jesus calls it a time of tribulation. And so a time of tribulation is coming. And I've had people ask me, why are you talking about tribulation? Because if you believe that in the rapture of the church and you believe you're going to be caught away, you're not going to be here. Why are you concerned about it? Because I want everybody to know about it. And I want everybody to know these truths because you don't want to be here. You want to escape it. You want to make sure that you have made your peace with God, that you have asked him forgiveness of sin, and that you are ready to meet him when he comes. That's what it's all about. The prophet Daniel outlined the tribulation sixfold purpose from the perspective of Israel, and I'm going to give this to you just real quickly to finish the transgression. Transgression, of course, against God, sins against God, to make an end of sins, to, put, to make reconciliation for inquiry uh, or iniquity, to bring everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision of prophecy as it's been given, and to anoint the most holy, which, of course, is Jesus Christ. Those six things were given in Daniel 9.24. Now, tribulation serves two main purposes, <clears throat> and I'm not going to talk about tribulation today, I'm going to move on to judgment, but number one, the judgment of God on a Christ-rejecting world. Now, when I preached this a few weeks back, I had a couple of people come to me and say something about judgment. They said, look, the Bible talks about judgment, and as we as Christians, what kind of judgment are we going to face? I'd appreciate it if you would think about getting out a pencil and paper and writing a few things down today because I guarantee you it's going to be helpful to you if you'll do that. But these two things the tribulation is going to, to accomplish, number one, the judgment of God on a Christ-rejecting world. Now, if we did not reject Christ, we're going to be there, aren't we, with, with him in heaven. We're going to be with him in heaven. So we'll not be here for the tribulation for this time. And second, the nation of Israel, the redemption of Israel. Israel is going to be redeemed. Israel is still, listen carefully, God's chosen people. The Bible clearly says that. And Israel will be redeemed, and that is coming. But the judgment. So what about judgment? What kind of judgment are you going to face? What kind of judgment is in store for the Christian? And this is very, very important. Well, <clears throat> I started a couple of weeks ago on this. There are seven significant judgments mentioned in Scripture. Those are given in different biblical time periods. Doesn't mean that all these judgments are yet to come. It means that some of them have already happened, and there are other judgments that are yet to come. And it's good for you to know, because everybody talks about, well, God's going to someday take a great big old scale, and he's going to weigh the good and the bad, and what I've done over here and what I've done over there. We'll talk about good and bad in just a few moments, and what that means to God, not you. We'll talk about that in a moment. And then God's going to make a judgment as to whether I'm good enough to go into heaven or I'm going to go to hell. What, what is the story? What, what do I do? How do I escape this judgment that's coming? All right? Now, there are seven of them. Number one, the believer's sin. Now, notice we say believer here. This person is a person who has put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, who already knows him as personal Savior. Now, you all know what I'm talking about when I say that? Do you understand what I'm, I'm talking about when I say that? 
it's okay to respond or say, yep, pastor, we know. All right, make sure you know. I want you to know. You have to put your faith and trust in Christ. You become a believer. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou, what? Shalt be saved. You'll be saved if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I've talked with you about believing. What does believing mean? Not just to have a mental assent, not just to say, oh yeah, there was a Jesus, I know a Jesus lived, and yeah, he can be the son of God, I guess that's all true, I don't really know. No, believing on the Lord Jesus Christ means to put your faith and trust in him. And I've talked with you about getting into something like an airplane, you believe in that airplane when you get in it. You can watch them all day, and they sure, they're soaring through the sky, but when you get in it, now it's a whole different story, isn't it? Now you're taking, you believe in that airplane when you put yourself into it. When you put yourself into Christ, you believe in him. Got it? That's exactly what that's all about. So, the believer's sin was judged by Christ on the cross. When Jesus sacrificed his life, he paid the price. Now, just, just let me say that again. He paid the price. One more time so we get it, okay? He paid the price. Now, listen, I ask this question to you carefully. Now pay attention because this is important. You ready? If he paid the price, is it paid? You with me? Come on. Is it paid? If Jesus paid it all, as we sing, as the Bible says, Jesus paid it all, then is it all paid? Or is there still a little bit of payment you have to make? No is the answer to that. Because Jesus paid the price for our sin. That doesn't mean that I'm going to have to pay some because he paid some, now I'll pay some. No. You see, that's what grace is all about. That's what forgiveness is all about. When Jesus forgave me of my sin, he paid the price. You see, the Bible tells me in the book of Romans, the wages of sin is death. You got it? Romans 3.23. But the gift of God, got it? It's a gift. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's Romans 6.23, by the way. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All have sinned. So when Jesus paid the price, he paid it. I just want to make that point to you because it's biblical. This isn't just my doctrine and my thinking and, well, that's the way the preacher thinks down there at that church. No, no, no. Let me tell you something. This is what God thinks because it's in his word. You with me? Uh, smile at me every once in a while, okay? I appreciate that. Grin and say, yeah, preacher, I know that's true. I absolutely know that's true. Do you know how I know it's true? Because I live, I've got it living in here. You know if you're saved. You know if you're a child of God. You know if heaven is your home. You know if you're secure in Christ. You know that. You know if you're going to go to be with Jesus someday. There's going to be a great meeting in the air. We're all going to heaven. When we all get to heaven, we sing all those things. Listen. We're going to be there if we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. So the believer's sin was taken care of on Calvary. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Listen, I don't just read scriptures just to pick one out and read it. Look what it says. It says that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Righteousness means right before God. Just to kind of make it simple for you. It means to be put into a right position. And you are the righteousness of God in him because your sin was taken care of on Calvary. How about a rousing amen to that, okay? Come on, the sin was taken care of on Calvary. I don't have to worry about sin in my life. Now, I'm not supposed to sin, of course. And if I do, I have to ask forgiveness. 1 John 1, 9 is to Christians, written to Christians, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You say, well, pastor, that's a verse that I've used for trying to win people to Christ and trying to let them know that they need, they need to know Christ and that Christ can take care of their sin. That's okay. I'm not going to fuss with you on that, but I do want you to understand that 1 John is written to Christians. 1 John is written to Christians. It is. He starts the second verse. My little children. Who are his little children? It says, John the beloved. He says, my little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. But if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. 
We have an advocate. We have one to go to plead our case. That's what an advocate does. So he's talking to little children. And in the context of that, he says that we're not to sin, but if we do, God forgives it. Isn't that good news? Come on, that's wonderful. Okay, the second one. The believer's self-judgment. Now, self-judgment is an important thing. You see, the believer should judge self and not others. We're so quick to judge everybody else, and that's human nature, I understand that. That's what we do. We look around, we see things, we don't like this, we don't like uh, something's doing, somebody's doing that, or something, and so forth. So we make judgments. But listen, God tells us that if we would judge ourselves, then we wouldn't have to worry about some other things, and I'll show you the scripture. When we serve communion in this church, I take you to the 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians. I may not always tell you exactly where that's found, but it's the 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians. And when you get to the end of that, after the Lord's Supper, after the Lord says, this is the cup and this is the, the bread, this do in remembrance of me, then it talks about judging self. And so he says in that passage, for if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. You know, there's something about judging yourself. If there's something between you and God that's breaking the fellowship and it's not good, then you judge it and get it out of your life. Then God won't have to judge it and get it out of your life. Because God's going to make it work. God's going to take care of that in one way or another. And many of us have been through that. Come on, all right? And then it says, we are, if we are judged, then we're chastened of the Lord, that we may not be condemned of the world. We're chastened of the Lord. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens, all right? I remember when my father used to chasten me. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. You've been chastened by a parent, I'm sure, at some time or another, and you know exactly what I mean. When God has to chasten us, it's not a comfortable situation. It's a very unpleasant thing. And when I walk with the Lord, when I'm walking with him in the light of his word, I don't have to worry. God's not chastening me. God's loving me, protecting me, helping me, doing all those things. When I step out of line and I fail to judge myself, you see, there is that self-judgment. So second thing is a believer's judgment, all right? Now, the third thing is a believer's works. Your works will be judged. And everybody says, well, I'm going to stand before God and I'm going to give account for my works. Yeah, you are. But let me, let me explain to you today very carefully what the judgment of your works is all about. It's not the way you're thinking. It says good or bad, but we'll talk about that in a moment. Anyhow, the believer's works, not sins, will be judged for gain or loss of rewards. All right, that's what it's all about in Scripture. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 says this, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Now, I want you to look at <clears throat> that passage, good or bad, in just a moment. This is called the Bema Seat, and the Bema was a place in the center of the tabernacle, of the temple. And it was a place that sat up on a couple of steps up high, and there was a large seat up there, and someone would get up there and read the Torah. That was the law of God. And out of the law of God, man was judged. And that's the way it was. So this is called the Bema Seat, or the Judgment Seat of Christ. You'll hear it called either one, okay? That's an important one. An accounting of our works will be given. Romans chapter 14, 10 to 12. For we all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, for it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Now, am I giving an account of myself to God so that God may approve of me and let me into heaven, or send me to hell, or is there another reason I'm giving an account of myself to God? Listen, the account has been settled. The judgment has been made. Your name has been written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and we'll look at that passage in Revelation in just a few minutes. This is not to determine whether I'm going to make it into heaven. We have, to, we have to break this cycle of belief and thinking. People think God judges. So God weighs on a scale your good things and bad things. What is good and bad in the eyes of God? That's a very important thing. The reason for this judgment is this. We all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, and look what it says. That each one of us may receive 
Oh, each one of us may receive. This is something about getting, receiving, isn't it? The things done in the body or while we were living here on this earth, that's all that means, according to what has been done, whether good or bad. Now, I want you to look at the words good or bad. You see, in the eyes of man, I do good things, I do bad things. God is pleased with the good things, and God doesn't like the bad things. The bad things could send me to hell. The good things could take me to heaven. Listen, your life is not based upon whether you're doing good or bad. If you're a Christian, you want to do good. Come on, church. You know that's true. You want to do good. You don't want to do bad. But good or bad is a judgment of God, and it's a judgment as to whether what you have done counts. The good is good and the bad is bad. Bad means, uh uh-uh. No, doesn't count. Now let's say you got up every Sunday and went to church 52 Sundays and didn't miss a one. When you were on vacation down there at that campground, you said to the family, I'm going to go down to this little church down here. I'm going to church. I will not miss church. God is going to judge that. Listen, God is going to judge that whether good or bad. You say, well, what do you mean good or bad? Of course it's good. If I get up every Sunday morning and go to church, it's good. Maybe, maybe not. You following me? Depends why you're here. You see, God looks at your presence here today as good or bad. You say, well, how can he look at it as bad? I'm here, aren't I? Isn't that good? Well, I know you are, but the question is why? Why? You see, the Bible says, don't don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. And so you say, Lord, your word says I'm to be there. And the pastor needs some encouragement today, so I'm going to go sit in the pew and I'm going to encourage the pastor. And I'm going to bless people around me and I'm going to say amen and I'm going to stand and sing and I'm going to praise your name and I'm going to worship you and I can't wait to get to church. I remember my dear old mother. Many of you remember mom. Some heads are shaking because you remember mom. My mother used to live for Sunday morning. I'm telling you, she did. Oh, she worshiped God every day in her home, read her Bible and prayed and did all of those things all of her life, not just as an old woman, as a young woman too. I remember sitting, I remember seeing my mom pick up her Bible. She wasn't watching TV, she was reading the Bible. That's what mom did most all, all of her life. I saw a mother reading her Bible. But, but the point is, you see, she couldn't wait for Sunday because she couldn't wait to get into the presence of the people of God. And she couldn't wait to sense the presence of God with the people of God. And she couldn't wait to feel the outpouring of the Holy Spirit of God in the church as she stood and sang and as she worshiped God. And my mom was never one to go, oh yeah, this is what... My mom would stand there quietly and tears would flow down her face at times as she worshiped Jesus and as she loved him and as she sang at the cross, at the cross. Where Jesus died for me, tears would come down her face as she stood right back there in that seat. I watched her many times. I could see the look on her face, and I knew she was worshiping Jesus. God looked at that worship as good. You get it? Church, I'm telling you something. We need to understand what this is all about. What this judgment of God is all about. I'm going to stand before him someday as a pastor and I'm going to give an account. Why am I here this morning? Am I here this morning because I'm expected to be here and I dare not miss? I'm only allowed so many Sundays a year. I've been taking many of those, have I? (laughs) I'm not here for that reason. I want to tell you why I'm here. Don't anybody misinterpret anything I'm saying here. But number one, I'm here because I love the Lord Jesus Christ, and I mean that with all my heart. It doesn't mean I'm perfect. It doesn't even mean I'm good enough in myself. I'm not. But I really do love the Lord. And I really love you. And I tell you that from time to time, don't I? You hear me say it. Uh, you hear me say I love you. <laughs> I do. Guys and the gals, I love all of you in the Lord Jesus. And I really mean that from my heart. It's precious to be here with you. And I love worshiping the Lord with you. And I love sharing his word. And this is such an important thing. You see, it's whether good or bad. So remember this. 
someday you're going to stand before God and give an account for what you've done. Now the bad works are going to be burned up and I'll show you that from 1 Corinthians chapter 3. According to the grace of God which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on that foundation. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid. Jesus Christ is already the foundation. If anyone builds on the foundation of Jesus Christ, gold, silver, and precious stones, or wood, hay, and straw, or stubble, each one's work will become clear. You see, on the judgment day, each one's work will become clear. Why are you here and why are you doing what you're doing? Why do you share a word of grace of love, of joy, of peace with another person, because that's what's expected of you? Why do you get up and walk around the auditorium and shake hands with everybody and say, I'm glad you're here today? Why do you do that? Do you do it because you love people and you're glad they're here and you're really sincere and you really care? God judges that. Do you put money in the offering plate grudgingly or happily? I'm so glad to support the work of God. I'm thankful that God blesses me that I can do this. And little sidebar here, the more you give and the more you share of what God's given to you, the more God blesses you. Amen. I'm glad somebody knows that. Because it'll be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work. What do you mean fire? God's going to put my works in the fire? I believe it's a fiery eye of the Lord Jesus of judgment. He's looking at your works, and he's judging what those works will be. If anyone's works, which he's built on, now, the words that are in italics here are not in the original text, but they're put in so it flows. Endures, he'll receive a reward. <clears throat> he will receive a reward. Now, that's an important thing. But if anyone's works are burned, he's going to suffer loss because he himself will be saved, yet so is by fire. Now, you're going to be saved because your name's written in the book of life and you're already there with the Lord. But bad works will be burned, good works will be rewarded. Oh, rewarded? Okay, that's right. There's reward coming. So that's important. Rewards will come in the, in, in, in the form of crowns. If anyone's work endures, he'll be rewarded, according to this passage. Now, what's the Bible say about crowns? That's an important thing. What about the crowns that are going to be given to the Christian? There are a number of crowns that I want to share with you this morning that are very, very important, and I want you to see these things. Five types of crowns are going to be given to those that are faithful. All right? Five types of crowns. <clears throat> okay, we'll get through them, don't worry. Number one, an incorruptible crown. Now I know you look at this and say, oh boy, I, I don't even get this. I don't know what's an incorruptible crown. Why do I need all this stuff? Why is this important to me? Just follow me. This, according to 1 Corinthians 9, 24 and 25, which we'll look at in just a moment, is for this. Here's what you're going to receive a crown for. Now, when you get there, the Bible says, I'm trying to teach you systematically so you understand these kinds of things. When you get there, crowns are going to be given. I want to, I want to hear, well done, that good and faithful servant. You've heard me say that. And I want to receive a crown, or two, or three, or four. I don't know how many I get. I may not get any. But if I get them, I'm going to throw them at Jesus' feet. But nonetheless, I want to receive a crown. Amen. It's given for exercising self-control. Hear it exercising self-control and for striving to do the very best you can before the Lord. You hear what I'm saying here? Now, how do I, why, why do I say that? Because the scripture proves it. Do you not know that those who run a race run all? Everybody runs in the race. Everybody out there on the field is running the race. You see them all running. But one receives a prize. Run in such a way that you might obtain it. You be the one that's out front. You be the one that's doing more for God. You be the one that gives more heart and more love to others in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You give your all to God. You sacrifice everything you have. You say, what? what? What are you asking me to do? I'm not, asking you to, I'm not asking you to do anything. But I'm telling you this. Rewards are coming. I want to be that person that's out front, all right? And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. The word temperate. Now, I want to take you back to what I just said. Self-control. Self-control. The one who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Do you have any idea what it means to become a runner? A person that competes? There was a fellow out here in Miamisburg whom I knew very well, ran in the New York Marathon every year. And I remember talking to Bob. I said, what are you doing this evening? He says, I'm running. What are you going to do after work, Bob? Running. <laughs> what are you, running. 
Uh, anytime you ask him, what, what are you going to do in your lunch? Running. Yeah. He didn't have time for anything else hardly in life. He just ran. And he'd go up and run that New York Marathon and Boston and a couple others. He ran in all, so many of them. But anyhow, everyone who competes for the prize is tempered in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown. So you get accolades and you get that little crown on your head and says, Woo, I won the New York Marathon or I won something. But for us, an incorruptible or imperishable crown. It'll never fade away, the Bible says. It'll be there forever. Now, I believe that people who get the crowns, something's very special for us in heaven. I do. I think you're going to rule over things. You want to run it here? Better get you some crowns. So you can do it forever up there. Right? Some of you are saying, nope, I just want to sit back and... <laughs> I'm tired of running it here. <laughs> All right. Incorruptible crown. The second one is a crown of rejoicing. Now, why would we rejoice? Because we've witnessed to people and shared our faith with people, and we've won other people to Christ. And when you do this, there's going to be a crown of rejoicing. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 2.19, For what is our hope, our joy, our crown of rejoicing? And they said, Is it not? Even you in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ that is coming. You know what? When I see people there whom I've won to the Lord and are in the presence of Christ, I'm going to look out and I'm going to see people. I'm going to see a Jim Ponso and I'm going to see some others. And I'm going to think, man, I led that guy to the Lord. Now, it's not me. I don't have anything to do with it except I shared the gospel and that person received Christ. And it says, our, our crown of rejoicing is rejoicing that you're in heaven with us in the presence of the Father. A crown of righteousness, 2 Timothy 4, 7 to 8. Given for loving his appearing. Loving his, are you following me now? I don't mean to go up over your head, okay? You've got to think with me, stay with me on this. Loving his appearing, what do you mean? Well, I'm glad Jesus came the first time, aren't you? I love his appearing that happened in the past. And I'm loving his appearing that's coming very, very soon. And if I'm loving his appearing, what's it going to do? It's going to change my life. I'm going to do what he wants me to do. I'm going to be very careful to be ready, be prepared when he comes. That's what it means, loving his appearing. I have fought a good fight, Paul says. I've, kept, I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also all who love his appearing. The crown of life. Crown of life. Revelation 2.10 is a wonderful one. It's given for patient endurance under trial. There are those people who have suffered tremendously for being a Christian. Hear me carefully. There are those people who have suffered tremendously for being a Christian. One of the things the church has done for many, many years is said this to people, and especially in happy-go-lucky America, okay? You come to Jesus and everything will be okay. You come to Jesus and it'll be fun. You come to Jesus, life will change and it'll be all good. But I want to tell you something. You come to Jesus and look out, you're going to have tribulation. You hear me? You come to Jesus and you give your life to Christ and Satan's not going to give up on you. He's going to badger you until he just tries to knock you down and hurt you. He's out seeking whom he may devour. And see, we don't understand it because we come to Jesus, we get our life straightened out, we think, wow, everything's... No, you're fit for heaven, you're ready for heaven, but, uh-huh, it's going to be a rough road. Jesus said, in this world you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Blessed is the man, James says, who endures temptation. That word temptation in the Greek means testing, for when he has been approved, approved, what do you mean approved? God approves. God approves. Hey, you suffered and you suffered well. He will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. And Revelation 2.10, don't fear any of the things which are about, you're about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison and you're going to be tested and you'll have tribulation 10 days. Be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. Crown of glory. This is given for shepherding the flock. Most people think this is given to just pastors. I believe it's given to those who are in the church and those who are responsible for helping shepherd the flock. 
I believe it's given to pastors and missionaries and others, but I believe it's given to elders and deacons and people in the church who faithfully shepherd the flock. I am not the only one that shepherds the flock here. There are under shepherds in this church, and many people are involved in shepherding, and shepherding means to care for. Got it? The flock, okay? Shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion. Well, I guess I'll take that again. You all want to elect me to that position, I'll do it again. Not by compulsion. No, I don't want you in that position if it's going to be by compulsion. All right, we pushed you into it, okay? But <clears throat> willingly, not for dishonest gain. Oh, I'm selling insurance and I'm going to go down here to this church that has 5,000 people in it. Whole lot of prospective people that can buy my insurance or buy one of my cars or a house or something from me. Listen, you think that's silly? I know of people who have joined some large churches in town because they're selling cars or selling houses or selling something and they want to be in with a whole big old crowd of people. I had a gentleman tell me that one time. The church is a little small. I want to go to a big one. A lot more customers in the big one. Well, okay. Not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. Not as being lords over people entrusted you, but be an example to the flock. Not as ruling, hey, do what I say, but be an example. You don't do as I say, do as I do. That's what's important. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive a crown of, crown of glory that does not fade away, that fifth crown. Now, the fourth judgment. And I'll give you just a few more, and these will come quickly, okay? There's seven, this is four. All right. The Gentile nations. You have Israel, and you have the Gentile nations. Israel would not listen to the gospel message. Jesus came into his own, his own received him not. Jesus was a Jew. Jesus was one of the Jews. And he came to his own, his own received him not. So, Paul took the message to the Gentiles. The Jews wouldn't receive it. They wouldn't receive the Messiah. So he took it to the Gentile world. And so there's a judgment of those nations because God has given everyone in the world an opportunity. And I want to tell you something. We're living in a day when nations have turned against God. Come on, church. Nations has turned against God. And this one is turning really, really, really fast, okay? All the nations, Gentile, will be gathered before him and he will separate out one from another as a shepherd divides a sheep from the goats. The nation of Israel is going to be judged again, all right? Israel as a nation will be judged during the time of Jacob's trouble. He says, I will make you pass under the rod and I will bring you into the bond of covenant. I will purge the rebels from among you. And those who transgress against me, I will bring them out of the country where they dwell, but they shall not enter the land of Israel. Israel is once again going to have a final judgment of God. Then you will know that I'm the Lord. God has been trying to tell them that Jesus Christ is the Messiah for all of these years. Angelic beings, do you know you and I are going to be in on judging the angels? At the end of time, after the second coming, second coming is the second coming, not the first coming. First coming is the rapture of Christ. Actually, it'll be the, there's three. The first one was when he came to, in Bethlehem, then when he came, when he comes to take us home, and then the third one, all right? And the angels who did not keep their proper domain but left their abode, he has reserved an everlasting change. He's going to bind them for a thousand years and put them in chains in a bottomless pit. And they'll be released for judgment of the great day. The last one is the dead. And this one, I moved through four, five, and six pretty quickly. I want to give just a moment to this. This is the great white throne judgment. I could actually spend a whole hour preaching on this. Oh, don't worry. I saw that look. Ugh. He's not. No, I'm not. But listen carefully. The judge, the dead will be judged at the end of the messianic kingdom. Now this means at the end of the thousand year reign of Christ. So let me set this up for you. Next thing that's going to happen is the rapture of the church. You ready? Church is going to go home, be with the Lord. For seven years we're going to be up here 
enjoying the marriage supper of the Lamb. At that time, rewards will be given out to the Christians. What's going on here on earth? Seven years of tribulation. After the seven-year period of tribulation, Jesus is coming back for his second coming. There's a rapture, there's a second coming. The Messiah comes back. This time, he puts his feet on the mount, the mount splits, there is a battle of Armageddon, God sets up a kingdom here on this earth, he controls everything for 1,000 years, the lamb will day, lay down with the lion, and the, plows of, uh, the, the, the spears will be uh, beat into plowshares and so forth, and there will be peace on this earth. At the end of that time, at the end of the messianic kingdom, the Messiah's kingdom, the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ is a literal, true reign. It's going to happen. Revelation 20. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were open, another book was open, which is the book of life. Now, God's opening up books, and God's opening up the book. Got it? The books are recording your life. I don't know if they're chips. I don't know what they are. I don't know what kind of books they are. I don't know if they're on one of the, you know, smartphones or whatever they're on. I don't know. If they're on that kind of, it doesn't matter. The books are open. And we want to look at it as a book, like this book. We want to see it as that kind of book. I don't know what kind of book. But I know this could be on a large screen before you. You could see your life. But if a person is standing before God at that time, they're standing in judgment. And they're standing at what is called the great white throne judgment. And there's one place they're going to go. And people will stand there, and if you open Matthew chapter 7, read Matthew chapter 7, because you'll, have, you, you'll, you'll read in there how people will stand before the Lord and say, Oh, but Lord, did I not prophesy in your name? Didn't I preach in your name? Didn't I do all kinds of good works in your name? Didn't I cast out demons in your name? Didn't I do all of these things in your name? And Jesus says at that time, he says, And I will say unto them, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity, I never knew you. You who work for Satan, I never knew you. Now, your name's written in the back, uh, Lamb's Book of Life, so Jesus knows you, all right? He knows you. But at that time, they're going to stand before the Lord. They're going to give all kinds of excuses. But Lord, I did this, I did this, I did this. I went to church, I went down there to Faith Live. I'm telling you, I went down because I was invited, and I went, and listen, I went to church, and I was a good person, and I tried to live right. I tried, what did you do with Jesus? What did you do with Jesus Christ? Did you receive him as personal savior? You can't play games with God. You have to be real. The judgment's coming, I'm telling you. And it's called the great white throne judgment. And people who are not ready will stand before the Lord on that day and the judgment will be given. And you'll give an excuse and you'll say, but I went to church and I did this and I was a good person. I, I tried to do it. Jesus will say, I'm sorry, I never knew you. You were not one of my children because the books will be open. And I believe you'll see your life. And maybe people will see opportunities that they had over and over and over to receive Christ as Savior and got up and walked out and rejected the gospel message. I'm just telling you that that's the truth. That's what it's going to be. Should we not know this truth? And the dead were judged according to the works. The dead are what? The dead, dead, yes. Dead means those separated from Christ. Got it? The dead are not just people who died. The dead are separated from Christ. What did Jesus Christ come to give us? Life. I give you eternal life. 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 We have life. We have everlasting life. There are some who are dead. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with the Lord in the air. We. There are some who are dead in Christ. Then those have just passed into death then there are those who are separated from God, and they're the ones who are dead. <coughs> dead to God. You've not been a part of God. You've been separated from him. You've never been a part of God. And total separation, all right? Now, all right, I'm going to close real quickly. I know you're finished. I'm not, but you are. Close, okay? All right, now listen. And death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one, every one, I don't know how long it's going to last. It's eternity. It doesn't matter, according to their works. And death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. I don't know how else to put it. People have told me, Pastor, you don't build a church by talking about hell. You don't build a church about talking about the lake of fire. 
That's not what you want to talk about. You want to make people feel good. You want to make people enjoy life. You want to make people prosper. You want to make people move on. Listen, I want to tell you, I want to warn you that there is a lake of fire. You don't want to go there. You hear me? The judgment's coming, and you don't want to stand before God as one who's dead or separated from Christ. You want to get on your knees and receive him as your personal savior. Say, Lord Jesus, I mean business and I invite you into my heart and into my life. Come in. I want to know you. I want to live for you. Many of you have done that. Very, very, very important. So there they are. The believer's sin, the self-judgment, the believer's works, the Gentile nations, the nation of Israel, the angelic beings, and the dead. Dead are those separated from God. That great white throne judgment is going to be terrible. You know a bad part about it? Oh, I don't know. Maybe it's not so bad. God's doing it. I'm going to be there at the great white throne judgment. I will be. The Lord himself shall shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the, the archangel and the trump of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. And we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with the Lord. And so, listen to these words. I'm quoting from... 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Listen, listen to what it says. And so shall we ever be. And that word ever be means forever be with the Lord. I want to tell you this. Where Jesus is, I will be. No other way of getting around it. I will be at the great white throne judgment. And we'll see the masses of people come before God. And the judgment will be given. <clears throat> Folk, I want to tell you something. We can't play. We have to be serious. There's a judgment coming. There's people who need to know Christ as Savior. You have the message. And we want to give it in love. We care. If you're here today and you don't know Christ as Savior, I want to talk with you. I want to talk with you. Don't leave. Seriously. Settle the issue. Get it done. But make sure you want to receive him as your Savior. Not just to avoid the fire, but because he went to Calvary and died for you. And he loves you, right? Amen. Father, we thank you for this wonderful day you've given to us. We thank you, Lord, for the blessed message that we have in your word. The promises that we have in your word. The truth that we have there. And Lord, sometimes it's difficult for us to look at that truth. Because as we see it, we see judgment. And yet we know that judgment for us will be a wonderful thing. That we'll receive rewards But Lord, there will be some who will stand before you in judgment because they've never received you as Savior. They'll be at that great white throne judgment. Oh God, help me to rescue people from that judgment. Help each one of us to take this so seriously that we truly will want to rescue people and tell them that Jesus died for them. They need to receive him as personal Savior. Not a complicated message, but a simple message. I pray, Lord, that you'll change our lives as we leave here today. Impress this upon us. It's coming. You've told us in your word. And now, Lord, since we've been warned, we're responsible. Help us to take that responsibility seriously and to share your love. Father, I thank you for this church. I pray a special blessing upon every life here, upon every person gathered in divine presence here today. I pray this will be a glorious week for us, even in the difficulties and struggles of life. I pray, Lord Jesus, that every one of us will know the joy of the Lord, will know the peace of the Lord, that the work of Satan will be so far behind us that we won't even have to say, get behind me. Satan, just don't bother us. Leave us alone. Dear God, Lord Jesus, flood us with your presence, your power, your grace, your love, and help us to just lift up our hearts to you in worship and give you glory and praise every moment of every day. Be faithful in reading your word and talking with you daily. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that the difference will be seen in our lives. People around us will know we have been with Jesus. Thank you for this message. Thank you for the singing today. Thank you for this time together in the presence of the Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' precious name. Dismiss us now with your blessing. Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. If anybody needs to talk,